But this week I'd probably be more interested in the, um, the football than the election. But that's got to end because we have an election this week, don't we? And uh, we're going to have to cast our vote. And we're very much aware, aren't we, that uh, even the best of leaders, the best intentions are only found with people. And often they're inglorious leaders in reality. But it's always good, isn't it, to come back to the Word of God, to come back to our God and remind ourselves of the nature and the perfection and the beauty and the greatness and the power of our God. And not our God in the sense that we have invented him, but the God who has drawn us by his love to love him and to know in our hearts that he is indeed God Almighty, that he is holy, holy, holy and resplendent in glory. And whatever leaders we get, and of course they're important and of course uh, we must study what's good and what's bad, it is good, it is always vital that we remember Christian church is not left alone. But the Spirit has been sent, the Word has been sent, that we may have direction and that we may know that our God reigns. We're going to look briefly at this uh, psalm this morning. David highlights the sovereign rule of God over all things, and he uses a picture of this great thunderous uh, storm, as it were, this great uh, impressive event of um, creation. And uh, that he seeks to impress upon the people the power of the living God, the glory of the living God, and the need for us to worship the living God in all that we do and all that we think. And indeed, the use of a storm, the use of uh, this sort of language was quite a word to the Israelites because they were often attracted to false religions, often attracted to Canaanite religion that had a great place, a great panoply of gods that uh, brought the thunder and did this and did that. And David reminds them it is none of those who even stirs the dust on the ground. It is the living God who rules. It's the living God who's sovereign. It's the living God who directs all things. And this great picture of a storm gives us a picture of the Creator and His power. And that's one of the beauties of the Psalms, one of the beauties of the Word of God, is that it, it brings us pictures and it brings us things that we can hang our thoughts upon and it directs us to see just how mighty and powerful our living God is. The psalm, uh, from first glance, breaks into a call for worship, verses 1 and 2. I've just said an illustration of God's power in verses 3 to 9 and then an affirmation of the Lord's kingship and blessing and kindness and mercy in verse 10 and 11. So a call to worship, verses 1 and 2. When we gather on the Lord's day, or whenever we gather in worship, we gather to do two things, don't we? We gather to receive and if you're not willing to receive, then you will not receive any blessing. If you're here just with cold hearts and stony ears, then you can be here for eternity and receive no blessing. But we must be ready to receive from the Lord and expect it. For the Lord has something to say to you and I this morning. And it's not just that we've got to this passage or that passage, but in his sovereign plan, he has something to say to you from this reading this morning. 
but also we're here to give. And it's always the same, it's always true, isn't it? If you're just a person who receives, then you'll never be truly blessed because as we receive, we are to give. That's a general truth in life and it's a, a vital truth in the Christian life, isn't it? But what is it we're to give? Well, David leaves us in no doubt. We are to give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And so that is what we're to give this morning. Glory to God, the glory that is due to his name. And that means to recognise, to truly recognise in our hearts and in lives and in our worship this morning, the glory that we are to give to God and the Lord's name. To recognise who the Lord is and to truly ascribe the worship that is rightly his. And this is so important, isn't it? I become so self-centred. Everything revolves around me or my family or even around our church. And it's so easy, isn't it, to forget that no, everything revolves around God. Everything is focused on him. And in his kindness, he has sent the Lord Jesus Christ into the world to reveal himself and reveal his very nature in the most effective way possible. And by the Holy Spirit, he touches our hearts and should cause us to want to glorify God. And so I pray, I, I pray that we do want to receive, but we want to give and we want to give glory to God. And that's not just a sort of a thing we do in church, a religious thing. God receives something as we recognise him. Not that we can do anything meritorious, but he loves to hear his people worship him. The Lord is ignored or maligned by society, isn't he? I have a situation where I work with someone quite often and once they were in the church, once they professed love of Christ, yet now they're far, far away. But there are many who have never loved the Lord in that sense. They, ignore, they malign um, God or else they ignore him. Well, we're not to be like that, are we? And I know we're, <coughs> we're to be those who stand in awe of our God. I used to have a relative who said, I don't like that word awesome, it's American and all this. The Bible uses it. The Bible gives that you should stand in awe of God. Now it sounds easy, but it isn't due to our sin, due to our preoccupation with ourself, due to my own failings. But we are called to give glory due to God's name. And so it means more than just outward worship, doesn't it? It means an inward movement of our spirit in true devotion, love and praise. So if you ever wonder, you know, what am I going to receive? What am I going to give today? Just spend some time in prayer and ask the Lord to help you to know how to worship. To stir your spirit. And if we are walking by the Holy Spirit and walking by in step with the Holy Spirit, he will do. And he will cause us once again to love the things of God and cause us to worship him. So it's an inward movement of a real work by the Holy Spirit. Secondly, it's a humbling of ourselves before the awesome majesty and glory that is God. It's a laying aside of pride. It's truly trusting the Lord in, in difficult situations. It's honouring the Lord with, with true faith. And those things are hard to do sometimes, but those things are things that really honour the Lord and glory the Lord. To 
be humble before him, to be truly trusting and honouring with true faith our living God. And then he says in this version, it says, in the beauty of holiness, or it can be, or uh, in the majestic worship, or the splendour of worship. And in one way, this, this sort of word has, has an idea of adornment, and perhaps it's uh, got a, a connotation to the way in which worship was carried out, and the way in which uh, the place of the sanctuary, etc., but it's also, and I, I think more, reflecting his glory and majesty as we worship. And perhaps above all, being adorned with his grace and mercy as the Holy Spirit works within us in Christ. Coming to him and offering him praise, saying, thank you, Lord the work of Christ within me. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy and the righteousness of Christ that adorns me and the grace that allows me to truly draw near. It's so true, isn't it? If, we, if each week we, we had to tot up the bill or tot up righteousness and unrighteousness, and if the righteousness pile was high enough, we could come and worship God and glorify Him. Or if the other pile was high enough, we weren't allowed to, we would never be here. But only because Christ is ours, we're in Christ, and we're adorned with His righteousness, and we can worship truly through that, then can we know the blessing of, of coming. And so we are uh, to give unto the Lord that glory. And the psalmist makes clear here, doesn't it? He first says, give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Now, who are the mighty ones? Well, some say it may be mighty ones on earth, but I would think it's the heavenly ones. The greatest of the greatest, or whoever they may be, are called to humble themselves and worship the as well as all the rest of the people. In verse 2, Give unto the Lord the glory due to his name in the beauty of holiness. And that's a wonder, isn't it? It is, it is in the majesticness of holiness. As we worship, really, we don't have to bring anything of our own. We are to bring the glories of God and who he is and what he is and what he is in Christ to him and just thank him and recognize that he is the one who has given us all these things. So let's give thanks that he who is in real charge over all things is the very opposite of what human leaders are. He is righteous, he is sinless, he is perfect, he is eternal, he is wise, he reigns on the throne forever, but more than that, he's a dear, dear heavenly father to his children, to his people who have trusted him. And though the devil may come to us at times and our own souls may come to us and say, God doesn't care, God always cares. And it's not in the sense of a sentimental care like we have, because that comes and goes. He cares for us in an eternal, loving, powerful way. He is indeed working all things for the good of those who love him in Jesus Christ, the eternal good. And so we're to give glory to God. I, I pray that we are coming to give glory to God and to think upon how we may glorify God in faith and, and humility and trust. Secondly, an illustration of the power and glory of God. Now, great storms are impressive, aren't they? And really, we haven't had many recently. If you go to some parts of the world, they shake the boots off your feet. They are very, very impressive. 
I had a nana who's passed away many, many, many years ago, who whenever a thunderstorm struck, would be found under the stairs, hiding. And in a way, it's quite comical, but it really did frighten her. It was an awesome thing. And when the thunder strikes, no wonder, because it is awesome. In these days, of course, of the psalmist, the thunder was the greatest noise ever to be. They had not what we have of the great sonic booms and the great uh, explosions, etc. But they knew what volcanoes were, they knew all these things, but the thunder was above all most powerful and it reminded them that there was other forces at work. And many of the false religions ascribed to the power of creation uh, to their gods, didn't they? And uh, the Canaanites, as I said, had many false gods and they ascribed this power to them. But today, if you are to go around and say, well, this is the work of God, even in just the normal things of creation, many people will think you're uh, being stupid, being naive, and above all, being obnoxious. And yet it's true, isn't it? That creation does talk to us. It doesn't save us. We must not worship it. But it does talk to us. It is the book of creation. It does bring a message to us. And it demonstrates to us, once again, in the way that God deals with us, his power and that he is over all things. In verse 3, here we see the voice of the Lord is over the waters, probably the Mediterranean Sea, the place where it was whipped up and uh, many false religions saw evil spirits and, and it was unpredictable. And yet God is in charge of that when it roars. The great cedars we see here split, perhaps by the lightning, the Lord is in charge of that. He is mighty and strong. The great Caesar is made like matchwood. Verses 6 and 7, Lebanon and Hermon skip like calves. It's as if the mountains shake and the, the aspect of the storm uh, flits across them. They seem alive. And in verse 8, we see the desert regions shaken. And all these events going on that, that show us the power of God. You will, most of you will know the story about Martin Luther. Martin Luther, that great monk who uh, indeed was used by God amongst other people to bring about a great reformation, at least in the understanding of Scripture. He was going along one day, he was studying for the law, wasn't he? And uh, apparently he was struck by lightning. Now, if you're not affected by that, you're, you're pretty, almost not here, are you? He was struck by lightning, but he survived. And he promised that day to give up law and become a monk. It's amazing, isn't it, how God works? Let's not ever put God in a box and say he can't work in various ways. And what came of that? But he was aware, wasn't he? He survived and we understand, but he was aware that there was more than the lightning. There was more than the outward thing. There was a God behind these things. And although we cannot, you know, say God's directing this and God's directing that in the sense of making a judgment, we can say that God has given us the power of creation to make us aware of his power and his greatness and his beauty and his sovereignty. The hymn, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all thy works thy hand hath made, I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, the power throughout the universe displayed is a wonderful hymn in a way, but it's also wonderful truth. 
It should cause us to give thanks to God. It should cause us to think of his power and his might. And so creation is important to remember we have a creator and he is over all things. And that his power can sweep away mountains. And his power brings down empires. And his power brings up empires. And the New Testament continues with this the, the link of God in creation when Jesus Christ stands up and stills the storm with the power of his voice. And even at the cross, where the evil one seems to be on the brink of a fatal blow against the gospel, as it were. God darkens the sky. Not so you say, well, bad clouds today, but so you cannot see your hand in front of your face. And he shows his sovereign power. And yet, wonderfully, he shows his sovereign power at the end of that. When Jesus is in the grave, passing aside, the normal realm of creation, normal actions of creation, and raises him from the dead back to life in darkness and nature's night. And so the power of God is seen in these things, and it should humble us, and it should have humbled the people of God. We live in a technologi technological day. You're not the only one who can't say words. And we can get so are we going on about AI now, aren't we? And you hear AI this and AI that. Well, these are nothing. God is all powerful. We're just scrabbling around in the knowledge He has given us. But He is the God who knows all things. He is the God who has all things planned. He is the God who will perform all His plans perfectly and according to his will. The Putins of this world will appear powerful, don't they? The various leaders of the world appear powerful, but it's not to them that we will bow the knee on the last day. It is to Jesus Christ as he comes and appears as the all-conquering king. The incoming government will want to exercise power, but it will soon see whichever governments is, that they have limitations. But our God has no limitations. And so David says, glorify him, but more importantly, give him the glory due to his name. And what does that mean in our lives? Well, it means this, that we should live in line with his word, that when we realise we can't do that because we're weak and sinful and failing, that we go to his word, that we go to him and we ask him for the strength and we trust that he will give us the strength. And as we go out to work, we apply these things to work. As we go to school, as we go to college, we apply the principles of his word. As we come to worship, we apply those principles in our worship and in our relationships with one another. And in verse 9 it says, the voice of the Lord makes the deers give birth. It's such a, a striking thing. The, the strips the forest bare. Remember that great storm in the 90s uh, down in the south where I used to live. It stripped everything bare. And here is this great picture of God's power. And in his temple, everyone says glory. There is no doubt, is it, in his temple that the God is due our glory. It is owing to him. And we should be people, and I'm sure we are, and I'm, I'm sure, I know we long to be, who give glory to God, not only in word, not only in, in church, but in our lives, and in our thinking. And surely we have no excuse 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6 says this, For it is the God 
who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And there is the key for giving glory to God. It is to love his Son and live for him forever. And as the scriptures say, if you do not give the Son the glory, you do not give the Father the glory due to his name. And thirdly and lastly, an affirmation of the Lord's kingship. The Lord sat enthroned at the flood. This word apparently used for flood is only used for the word that was used in Noah's flood. Is there any greater picture of power than that? There the glory and power of God is shown in the, the judgment of humanity. And that reminds us that we are to be careful, aren't we? Because it's so easy to judge humanity, to judge society, when God has indeed chosen to indeed make this the day of grace. And though we must make judgments, let us continue in our efforts to hold out the gospel that indeed says your judgment has been taken from you and Christ has paid that judgment and God is willing and able to forgive you and receive you back into his family. <coughs> and that is in a sense, the two pictures that the God will deal with sin, but God also has that mercy and that way of redemption that is open today. But the Lord is king forever. He is king forever. <coughs> Poor, I don't know what you think of President Biden, but he's had a bit of stick, hasn't he? And uh, he certainly will not be around. God will be. For God has no beginning and no end. Yet also the power of his grace is shown, isn't it, in Noah's, in the flood. And so it's a picture of Jesus Christ. And the Lord is the one who gives peace. He gives lasting peace. And the Lord gives strength to his people. Remember when the Lord prayed for his disciples, Lord, I'm going. But these are still in the world. And the Holy Spirit is sent, isn't it? To give strength. And when we come to the Lord and give glory to him, we receive strength as we do that in every way possible. And he says, the Lord will bless his people with peace. Well, Israel and the people of God certainly didn't have peace all the time and we see the differences even today with uh, various results of various things. But the Lord has been true to his promise that when we humble ourselves and give glory to you, to him, he lifts us up and gives us peace. And so I pray this morning that you are trusting in Christ, that you have humbled your hearts. We have bowed the knee before God and given him the glory that is due and trust in his son. And you know, we know the answer, don't we, to the election. Yes, do your duty. Do what you think is your duty. But above all, look upward to God and trust in him for he will not fail you. May he receive all the glory.